Awesome, guys. So uh, I've been listening to the talk so far. Uh, my talk is super DeFi focused, uh, which I think uh, even if you're not as interested in DeFi, I believe this crowd should be more interested in decentralized storage uh, and everything that Protocol Labs has bring, uh, been bringing up. Uh, even if that's the case, I think there are plenty of game theoretic and also incentives mechanisms that I'm going to cover that are finance focused that could be applied elsewhere. Uh, so that could be an inspiration just to bring something from a different area. So the topic that I wanted to bring up today is that in DeFi there are various different uh, incentive mechanisms that create very new types of markets. And basically the topic for this one is that there has been a market emerging for like one year or so in, in DeFi specifically. Uh, that's very particular because it is a three-sided market. While most markets in the world are two-way or two-sided markets, right? So uh, whenever in macroeconomics and other uh, disciplines like that, we, will, we think about markets in general, it's redundant to say that they are two-sided. They are by default two-sided, right? A couple examples, uh, very traditional, very uh, normal ones. Uh, any e-commerce store is a two-sided marketplace uh, between buyers and sellers. Uh, Web2 has brought up uh, various new uh, two-sided marketplaces as well. Uh, so between hosts and guests, drivers and riders, uh, so all of these function according to normal microeconomic uh, principles of supply and demand and prices basically matching those, right? But just between two parties. And what I'm going to bring up today is uh, a market for liquidity, which is one of the most important things in DeFi and also in other uh, crypto um, areas, let's call it that. Uh, that is three-sided between very uh, different uh, basically th very, uh, very different three agents that participate in it, right? Before we get into that, I have to just make a very, a very simple introduction to the vote escrow model, which is a tokenomics model that has been gaining a lot of traction uh, ever since like 2020 up until late 2021. In DeFi specifically, it was pioneered by Curve. I'm gonna uh, simplify a lot of uh, mechanisms of how it works. We're just going to focus on the essential thing so that we have that background info to then proceed to what are these, uh, these three sides of markets, right? So uh, this is a simple diagram for how it works. Again, oversimplifying a lot of it. Uh, feel free to just uh, reach out to me afterwards if you want to discuss it in more depth. But essentially what we have is that we have protocols and DAOs that emit a constant amount of tokens each uh, time period, right? Each block, each week, each month. Uh, whatever they decide in their particular implementation. And so that's uh, what's there in the left as token emissions, which are liquid. They are actually tokens that the protocol mints or emits from their treasury uh, for some, some incentivization. Uh, that incentivization is uh, LPs, liquidity providers. So this model has been used uh, by DEXs, decentralized exchanges, uh, that need people, agents, to provide liquidity for people to trade against that liquidity in those exchanges, right? So we have uh, various pools. It can be uh, an arbitrary number of pools. Uh, and we have people or organizations, any type of agents providing liquidity towards those. And then we can see that the arrows from the initial token emissions uh, have different weightings to the different pools. And we're going to go over what spe specifies or what determines what's the weight that each one receives. That's the interesting part here. Uh, but basically, and uh, jumping that step to come back to it later, LPs receive tokens that are liquid from these DEXs, from these protocols that want to incentivize liquidity there. They have two main cho choices with those tokens that they receive. They can basically sell them for yields, so they can just uh, sell them for dollars to reinvest in their positions or to just take some uh, value off the table. Or more interestingly and more pertaining to this model, they can lock those tokens up. Uh, the way they lock those tokens up is called vote escrow. That's the whole name of V tokenomics. Um, and basically, if they do that, they're uh, willingly opting to lose liquidity on those tokens for a fixed number of years. Uh, normally, it goes between one and four, but again, those are implementation details. Uh, if they do that, uh, what they get in, in, in exchange for losing the liquidity on that is that they gain a governance power over this protocol, right? Uh, that's uh, what they get in, in exchange for losing the liquidity for a fixed time period in the future. So in this mechanism, the only tokens that have actually governance power are the ones that are locked. So the liquid ones are just financial instruments that trade and are able to be sent around, but they don't have governance power. The ones that do are the ones that are vote escrowed or locked. 
Uh, so whenever you lock them, you basically get a V version of the token that you had liquid before. Then what happens is that these people or these agents in general, because they can be institutions or DAOs, whatever, uh, they get to vote on different governance proposals for the protocol that implements this tokenomics design. Uh, there are plenty of different votes that they can vote for. The one that's interesting for us for this talk is that they can vote for what's called voting gorges, which are basically a list that uh, matches almost one by one the list of pools that are listed in these decks. So basically they can uh, vote for which uh, gauge they want to have more weights in terms of voting or less. What that does is that at the end of each voting round, which is normally one week, but again, that's an implementation detail, uh, basically it comes back to how those liquid tokens are distributed in the next round, so, right? So uh, what happens is that the percentages of the votes on each one of these gauges that again match one by one the pools that we have uh, will determine what's the weighting given from the initial tokens that will be distributed to each one of the pools. Uh, so if a uh, gauge gets 30% of the votes, then in the next round, 30%, uh, again, there are some details there, but simplifying it, 30% of the tokens that are emitted for that round will be given to the LPs in the pool that got 30% of the votes, right? So that's the basic model. Uh, here we have the actual uh, wor real world example of that model, right? The previous slide was the abstract version. So we have CRV emissions, which is a token. It's one of the biggest decentralized exchanges in the world. Uh, those are liquid tokens. They are ERC-20 implementations, uh, pretty standard. They're given to different uh, LPs to compensate them for the liquidity that they're providing. Uh, these are just a couple of random examples of actual uh, pools there. Then these guys can sell the CRV for yield and just get paid from that, or they can lock the CRV, get VCRV, uh, and these ones are locked for between one and four years. The longer they lock, the more governance power per token they receive, uh, basically incentivizing them to be long-term aligned with the protocol instead of uh, just being there for the short term to profit quickly, right? So then the VCRV holders, and again, uh, these people don't need to come from LPs, they originally do, but they can just be agents that purchase CRV in the open markets and then lock them up. So there are various ways of acquiring that governance power. Then these guys vote for the gauges, and that's an example of uh, basically one of those voting rounds. After being over, uh, there's basically different allocations for each, and then those uh, slices in the pie chart will determine how thick those arrows up there are in the next round. So this is basically the normal um, overview of vote escrow tokenomics. Other protocols that implement that are Balancer now and uh, a few others coming up that are uh, more recent. Now we're gonna go over how this creates a three-sided market. I think this is the most interesting part of the talk and until now it was like context for us to go over this now. Uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, it's very rare that we find a market between three different sets of agents that have different incentives all between them. And that's why uh, I think it's an interesting uh, topic. So this is basically the uh, market structure for this. We have on one side liquidity providers. We've covered who those are, basically people depositing tokens on LP pools uh, in these DEXs that are basically uh, allowing other traders to trade their tokens against the liquidity that they have provided, right? Then we have liquidity seekers. We're gonna go over in the next slide who those people are or who those organizations are, uh, who those agents are. And then we have governance power holders and those we already know are the ones that hold the vote escrow tokens, the V version of whatever governance token we're talking about. So the way this works is that governance power holders will direct with their votes new emissions, so new token emissions that are liquid and tradable and have a market value to the liquidity providers. Then liquidity providers are providing liquidity for the seekers. We're going to go over who they are. And then this, uh, uh, this side of the market should be incentivized because there's money on the table, there's value on the table, to compensate in some way the governance power holders because the more they vote for the pools that we want to make liquid, uh, the better for uh, the seekers, right? They want to have some sort of asset liquid on chain. So simplifying, we have the LPs. Here for uh, liquidity seekers, it's mostly DAOs and protocols that want to make either their own governance token liquid for various reasons, or if they have products that live or buy by their liquidity. We're gonna go over a few examples of those. And then we have V tokens, the people that hold the actual votes and governance power there. And then uh, finally, the actual real world, world example, we have uh, different pools uh, with different people providing liquidity. We have a couple DAOs and a couple protocols here, uh, Lido, Frax, and Rocket Pool, that have uh, 
products that they do want to make liquid. So in one case, it's liquid staking derivatives, so a liquid way to stake uh, tokens in POS chains. And then this is a stablecoin from Frax uh, that also should be liquid and tradable one-to-one -one uh, with dollars. That's what makes the stablecoin work. And then uh, we have the V token holders. There are plenty of examples we've been covering Curve, but uh, there are plenty of others. Uh, now, uh, we're going to go over uh, how these markets actually uh, work in practice. So, up until now, what we have seen is how the LPs and the V tokens interact, right? On this previous slide here, uh, this is just a diagram between LPs and then the voters. And now we're going to go over how the voters and the liquidity seekers interact next. Uh, since it's a three-sided market, there are uh, basically interactions between all of those pairs. So the types of markets that have been uh, developed around this concept and around this opportunity that lives on chain are, I, I brought here a couple examples. These are actual implementations of different protocols that have markets for this. And again, I'm gonna oversimplify how each one of these works in the next slides, but uh, the overall picture will be hopefully uh, somewhat useful uh, or interesting. So this is one of the models. Uh, this is the model that Hidden Hand implements, but there are other uh, venues for trading uh, these votes like that. So what we basically have is that we have, uh, again, if you remember, we have basically a list of pools uh, where people deposit liquidity in these DEXs. Then we have a list that matches pretty much one-to-one -one of gotchas where people vote for the pools that they want to make more or less liquid in the next round. And now we have another list that also matches close to one-to-one -one, uh, with uh, some exceptions to the previous two ones, uh, which are uh, basically, we, we can call them uh, incentivizing or bribing gotchas uh, in, in some of these protocols. So basically what this is, it's just a pool of capital and a pool of votes. Let's call it that abstractly. Uh, what happens is that liquidity seekers, uh, agents that want to make some token liquid on chain, uh, can just deposit funds and these funds can be in their governance token, the token that they themselves mint. It can be in uh, ETH um, or in stable coins, whatever they want to incentivize with. And they just deposit those funds in this uh, box at the top. Let's call it a box. Uh, and then uh, we basically have the other side of this market, so the V token holders, the, actually, the actual voters that get to a website or get to a contract and just see a list of different boxes like these with different amounts of funds deposited by dif different liquidity seekers, right? And then since they have the votes, they can just choose which one of those offers is more interesting for them to allocate their votes for. Uh, which will therefore uh, allocate emissions and new token incentives for the LPs in those pools, right? So uh, these people or these agents, again, they, they don't have to be individuals, they can be institutions, DAOs, whoever wants to participate, um, can just look at those lists and the ones that have, and, and basically here they have a decision, which is uh, the way it will work in the end of the round is that all of the funds that were in each one of these boxes will be distributed uh, proportionally to the amount of votes that that got got. So for example, if we have three of these, one has 1 million USD, another has uh, 500K, and then another has 100K, uh, it's not clear which one of those would be the most profitable because uh, the one with 1 million may get disproportionately more votes as well. So basically those funds will be distributed evenly and proportionally to which one of the votes that ended up uh, committing towards that pool, right? Uh, so basically, these people, the, this uh, side of the market, will commit their votes to one of the pools and then split the funds that was in there at the end of the voting round. And then the liquidity seekers, DAOs and protocols, will deposit the funds at the beginning or whenever they want in the voting round, and then they will get votes voting for their gauge and thereby incentivizing new emissions to their LPs, uh, making the pools deeper. This is one of the models. The second model that I wanted to bring up, it uh, works in a very different way, but has interesting pros and cons and trade-offs that we're gonna explore, explore at the end. And that's also the interesting part too. So the way this works, this was implemented by Quest, which is a Paladin product. It's that uh, basically liquidity seekers, DAOs and protocols can just make offers uh, for how much they're willing to incentivize per vote that they receive at the end of the voting round, right? So uh, this is kind of like, a, uh, the same model that, uh, again, it, this is kind of a, uh, a, a, an analogy with some uh, points that it breaks under, but uh, it's basically the same as a market maker on a central limit order book exchange, uh, making offers for how much they're willing to sell or purchase a share for, uh, for a fixed price. It's like a limit order, right? 
where people, uh, or not people, but liquidity seekers, just make a fixed uh, compensation per vote that they're willing to pay, and also a cap up until how many votes are they willing to purchase or incentivize during that uh, voting round. And then the V token holders, the people that hold the voting power, can just go there, uh, look at the different offers, and commit their vote to the one that's more interesting to them, right? So this is uh, an, another model with fixed um, costs or incentivization amount per vote, uh, while the previous one will have variable incentivization or compensation amount per vote, as we're gonna see. So the pros and cons of these two, uh, these two first points are for the liquidity seekers, and then the last points are for the voters themselves. So in the first model, again, the one where we have a pool that then splits um, between the different voters proportionally that voted for that, what may happen is that a DAO or protocol, the liquidity seeker in general, may end up the round overpaying per vote that they got. Uh, the reason for that is that they commit the capital towards those pools before knowing how many votes are actually gonna go there, and that number is determined by market forces and by uh, the competitive landscape of the other uh, incentivizers as well on that platform. So they may end up overpaying per vote, but may, uh, they may also end up underpaying per vote and being ROI positive on that incentive, right? Uh, the good thing uh, is that they will always get votes using that model, because even if they were just incentivizing a very minimal amount, like one, let's call it like one dollar, uh, just like deploying one dollar uh, of incentives for people to vote for their pool, uh, what would happen is that if it didn't have any vote until the end of, of the period, uh, someone would have the incentive to add one marginal vote towards that and just collect all of that because there would also be no competition. So. Uh, since this balances uh, the amount of votes and the capital that's allocated to them, uh, what happens is that everyone that incentivizes ends up getting votes because marginal votes should go, if we're talking about rational economic agents, to the pools where uh, the payoff will be better. And if there's one with zero voters, the payout will be like uh, infinite, right? Because you'll get all of uh, the capital that's incentivizing that one with just one vote. So those are the pros and cons. Uh, on this side, again, this one is the fixed uh, compensation per vote model here on the right. What happens is that an incentivizer, a DAO, a protocol, a liquidity seeker, assures from the beginning, if they run proper models, that they're um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty certain that they will end up uh, getting ROI um, on, on their incentive, uh, incentives deployed there. Uh, because they can just fix and set how much they're willing to compensate for each one. So they can just set it uh, slightly below whatever they believe the expected value per vote will be in the next round. So they have more control over that, right? A priori, which is important. Uh, the thing is that whenever we try to fix prices uh, in economics in general, what may happen is that supply may not match demand, right? Whenever uh, if either government or other um, external agents from the market try to fix prices, uh, it may happen that at that price, there's no matching between supply and demand. And here it's exactly the same. So uh, basically they may end up getting zero votes if all of the other options that live on chain for the same round are more profitable for the voters, they'll just end up not getting votes, which uh, can have harmful, harmful effects uh, in terms of their pools uh, losing incentives and thereby losing TVL, thereby losing liquidity, thereby making the product worse. Um, then uh, here, it's basically the point of view of the voters themselves. So in the first one, whenever they're committing their votes, they don't know how much they're gonna be compensated per vote that they're committing, because again, there are all of those uh, market dynamics until the end of the round. So they get a variable or unpredictable reward, which may be good or bad. So they basically may end up getting uh, paid less than they would have if they took a similar fixed price offer. Uh, however, they may also end up being compensated more and it's kind of variable uh, and there's no uh, good way to just uh, lock in how much you're going to receive. Again, that can be good or bad. It just depends on your risk appetite there as a governance power holder. And here, you know whenever you take one of those fixed price offers that you're going to get uh, compensated that amount, right? So uh, there's more certainty, less upside and less downside. Uh, so it's just a different risk profile. It's not like one of the models is better. Uh, these are two different markets that have been live uh, for a bit. Uh, and I expect that uh, new ones will come uh, with new designs and uh, new trade-offs between the different agents. So that was the talk. Again, uh, this was a very uh, short intro. I had to oversimplify a lot of the V tokenomic side, also this um, bribing side as well. 
so if you have any questions, I'm super happy to go more in depth, or also you can just uh, reach me. This is my email. You can also reach me outside. Uh, super happy to talk about this type of stuff. So thank you for, for the attention and yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, I have a question, I'll kick it off. Um, so I think I'm still trying to get my head around the, the reason to add the third component in, other than it's just like interesting and fascinating. Uh, so was it, well, well first off, you said it, it's, it's running now. Is it, are both of those like separate smart contracts on Lido or is Lido doing one and one other ones on a different? Ah, uh, cool. Uh, so this is not what Lido does. Um, Basically, Lido is a participant in this market, but Lido didn't build this infrastructure. These are other markets on chain that live. Uh, Lido is one of the liquidity seekers. That's why I ended up diving into these types of markets because I do mostly liquidity research and think about uh, liquidity on chain and stuff like that. Uh, so Lido would be uh, categorized as one of the liquidity seekers, one of the agents that want to have votes incentivizing their pools. So Lido didn't build, um, these types of markets, it's just one of the participants in there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay. And so then to add that third uh, step in the, in the market, is, is the purpose to create an ability to distinguish like, hey, this is a longer term vote, they, they locked more tokens and, and put more uh, you know, value locked into the system so that's more stable. They put those in so that they're gonna last longer so they get more votes so that they can then go vote for their delegate of choice to get more rewards mm -hmm. was the original. Is that the kind of reasoning, mm -hmm. or is there something else kind of there that I'm that I'm kind of yeah? Uh, just to uh, clarify, if I understood uh, correctly the question, basically you're saying that this could be done as a two-sided marketplace instead of having people compensate people that will vote, and then these ones will determine the emis emissions afterwards. Why don't the first group just uh, direct their own emissions or their own capital to pay LPs. Would that be kind of the general direction? I think so, yeah. I'm just trying to suss out like why why add the, the three together. Does it yeah. make it inherently more stable or? No, it, it it's, it's basically that. This was basically like in DeFi and in general in crypto, all of these tokenomics designs are being experimented with. Uh, this was one of the designs by Curve originally that uh, is now being adopted by other protocols. And that's kind of like an empirical um, argument for it being kind of working, at least, if other protocols are adopting it. Uh, initially, uh, Curve didn't design this to have all of these markets around it, um, but they basically just built a primitive that ended up allowing people to build this type of stuff over it. The initial premise of VETO economics, and again, I didn't build this, so it's kind of weird that I'm talking about what was the original premise, but uh, from my understanding is that you basically have an incentive for people to lock up your tokens, your governance tokens, for a very long fixed period. For example, four years. Uh, most, uh, an interesting stat is that most CRV is actually uh, locked for a very long time. So it, it actually is what happens in the market. People do choose to lose their liquidity and lock it for a long time. Uh, normally when it drops from like four years, it drops a couple of months, people just relock it to have the maximum voting power per token that they can have. Um, and then you basically have all of these people aligned with this DEX long term. Uh, one of the problems of decentralized exchanges in general is that it mostly in DeFi, liquidity is mostly mercenary. So it just goes to the DEXs that are incentivizing more at each time. Uh, and there's, it's difficult to create a lock-in and a network effect and a defensible moat as a protocol there in DEXs. So this was one of the ideas to create a moat, a defensible, um, basically a defensible advantage uh, to some of these DEXs. So basically, if you have um, millions, uh, hundreds of millions of capital locked up as VCRV, you have uh, a very large capital base that will keep incentivizing these pools for years to come, right? So it's more difficult to siphon liquidity out of Curve than it is to siphon liquidity out of, for example, SushiSwap or others that don't have that. So that's kind of the rationale for a DEX to implement that. And then Balancer, uh, very interestingly, adapted this model with a... a, a a very interesting uh, adaptation that we don't have time to discuss, but they did end up, and Balancer is also one of the most prominent DEXs in, in Ethereum DeFi. Um, and, and yeah, they did choose to go into that, this model, which is kind of like a proof that it was uh, at least somewhat working, right? Uh, like an, an, uh, an empirical uh, 
argument for that instead of just a philosophical argument of does it work or not. Uh, it, it, it is generating a lot of volume and a lot of liquidity, so, so there should be some value at least in, in that kind of design. Uh, this talk was not as focused in terms of explaining the mechanism, it was just to use that as basis to then go over the market and how they interact with each other and all of that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's super helpful. Appreciate Thank you. That. Uh, other questions? Uh, to add a little bit, I think that the reason why it's separated to three is because it's just separating out like the people that have the incentive of just holding the token and getting extra yield versus the ones that are going to optimize it and find like the most lucrative place to, to put it. So that's probably the, like, the impetus behind the third. Uh, but my question was, <clears throat> um, if like for Curve and Balancer, as you said, like the reason why that they wanted to do it is both to reduce mercenary capital and then also to like increase the amount of LPs because theoretically you're raising the yield and you're going to get it back to a yield that's like sustainable. So like there's going to be more LPs flooding the system that aren't just going to be like mercenary, like switching in and out between different pools as they start to optimize. Like, is there any research that you know of that's like gone through and checked like how much net new LPing has gone on because of this, as opposed to just people being like opportunistic and like flipping back and forth between what's the most lucrative within it? Awesome, awesome question. And I agree with the first point there. Uh, but uh, yeah, awesome question. Uh, my view on that is that it's very difficult to understand causality in DeFi in general. We can look at correlation a lot. It's very difficult to uh, try to get causality from that. Uh, my view is that this uh, model as a moat, as like a way to defend liquidity in a, in a DEX that you're building, uh, should kind of work. Um, th there are some flaws that I, I, I believe they, it has, but should kind of work because you're basically using your market cap, the market cap of the DEX, like a, a curve, balancer, velodrome, whatever, as a way to defend against new entrants and, and uh, other DEXs that could take like fees out of the pools and all of that. Uh, because uh, normally uh, there's like three ways, the three main ways uh, by which LPs are uh, paid in DeFi or compensated in DeFi. One of them is just trading fees. That's the most sustainable one. So people trading on against that liquidity end up paying fees and they get that. But that's a very, uh, there's a bit of, a very slight bit of a moat there, not too deep. Then the other one is just with direct incentives. So liquidity seekers, DAOs, protocols, etc., can just directly incentivize that. Uh, so just give their own tokens, USD, uh, USDC, uh, other stables, etc., to those LPs. And then the third one is this. So basically compensating votes that will then direct the native deck emissions towards those pools. Uh, this last one, it, it, it kind of creates a, a um, a dynamic where there's at least always a baseline of uh, TVL there in those uh, DEXs. Why is that? It's because uh, trading fees are super volatile, right? Uh, but the emissions that the protocol itself is emitting to an LP, it's not as volatile because, for example, Balancer emits 145k uh, BAL tokens towards all of the LPs there per week. So as long as Balancer has um, a good market cap, that will be a constant incentive to provide liquidity on Balancer, even if the trading volume decreases a lot, right? Again, on Curve, same thing. Uh, they emit a fixed amount that keeps declining over time, um, but uh, they, they emit a fixed amount uh, of CRV emissions towards those LPs. So there should always be some incentive as long as those DEXs are successful to LP there, uh, which should keep uh, liquidity a bit sticky. One of the things that you mentioned is that uh, wouldn't this still be mercenary capital that is there because of these incentives and then can go elsewhere? That's totally true. But uh, the DEXs don't really care who is LPing, they care that someone is. And so even if it's mercenary and other people come in, the important thing is that there's always incentives to LP there and to liquidity provide there. Uh, so that would be my reason. In terms of the research, I'm not aware. Uh, there's very, very interesting research about like how AMMs work and how uh, DEXs work and all of that. Uh, by uh, Guillermo and Garys, by Tarun Chitra and others. Uh, but uh, trying to figure out this causality between is it because it's a V model that has uh, protocol emissions towards that or is just like a Uniswap model without emissions that just works um, without that? Uh, I'm not aware of any research there. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
do you even think it is a benefit to smooth out liquidity during load like volume volatility or volume times like why would that actually be a benefit because for the protocol they just end up paying a lot more for tvl than what they're getting out of it in terms of fees so it's almost like a net negative for them to keep providing liquidity like keep providing those incentives during that yeah uh basically it's uh lps in general in DeFi are also kind of um, a flywheel flywheel where uh, traders should be incentivized to trade wherever the deepest liquidity for their pair is. And then LP should be kind of incentivized to LP or liquidity provide wherever the most volume is being traded, right? So what, uh, uh, again, this is like a, a market shift too much to say this with like full uh, confidence, but what should happen is that the most liquid venues should get more liquid over time because they are attracting more volume and thereby more trading fees, which are sustainable, uh, and then more LPs because they want to capture their, those extra trading fees. So it's kind of difficult to bootstrap that liquidity uh, be because if, if it has no depth, there's no people trading there. So there's no new liquidity incentivized to go there. So it's kind of a bootstrapping problem. So my view is that it would be kind of bad to have these DEXs uh, go, have their TVL go down super uh, low uh, even if it's a period with not too much trading, because then it would be super difficult for them to uh, capture all of that liquidity back. Uh, normally, what, what happens is that like these most liquid DEXs, even Uniswap, that's very different from this model, uh, keep their TVL quite high over time, uh, at least priced in tokens. In, priced in dollars is just a market force, but um, uh, it, it's it's not very common. And, uh, it's, it could be something that you could try in the future just to build something that has liquidity in time. Uh, that would be kind of the, the idea. But uh, what has been normally done in DeFi is that they try to keep their depth high uh, over time so that they don't have like constant bootstrapping problems whenever they would want to come back. So that, that's kind of like more of an empirical answer, not as much like what I believe. Uh, it's more like what I've seen. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you.